Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another Go video. In today's episode, I'm going to be sharing with you five tips for writing idiomatic Go. Tip number one, use GoFump. GoFump is a tool that takes your source code, it formats it in a way that it follows the guidelines that are coming from the Go team. This is cool because we have a way to keep all our source code consistent across multiple, you know, people, multiple teams, multiple languages, as in speaking languages, um, and it allows you to keep everything more or less consistent. Now, depending on your IDE or editor, you may need to configure this in a different way because it's not installed when you install Go. You have to install it manually. I'm using here GoVim and in GoVim when you call the go install binaries it actually uh, if you can see down here oops see what the heck is going on when you call go install binaries it actually downloads and install GoFoam for me the cool thing about this is like i said it keeps everything more or less consistent if i decide to you know add a line break right here it will format the code in a way that it will make sense for the guideline that i'm following which is you know the GoFoam guideline and in a way, it, 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 we don't have this, you know, discussion when we are doing, for example, code reviews. Uh, doing a code review is that, hey, what are you adding in spaces? What are you adding tabs? And those kind of things that are really not relevant in the context of what we're trying to review right here. So the code is following a guideline and uh, how, how it is structured, how it's organized, the spaces, if you're using spaces instead of tabs, those kind of things are handled by the tool. Now, this is not the first time a tool like this exists. There is a, another one called C Lang Format that allows you for another different languages like Java or C++. It allows you to do something like this, but I like this one because it's coming directly from the team that built the language. So let's jump into tip number two. Keep receiver names short. So the idea of this is that when you're defining a method, when your receiver, which will be the argument that you're receiving first, if you remember one of the videos I covered before, the receiver is typically behind the scenes. It is, no, it's not typically, it is the first argument in the function. So in the method, the first argument will be the name of your type, or right? it will be receiving the type that you're attaching it in the function. So for example, if I'm defining a new method for the user, uh, type I will use the u variable name in this case if I'm using client I will use c so typically what I like to do is take the first character of the type name and use that as the argument name in go you should be avoiding names like self this and me because those are coming from other programming languages and really don't necessarily apply to this language specifically let me show you a piece of code to demonstrate this so here i have an example of a type called parser with a few made up functions or rather methods that are applicable to this type they don't necessarily do anything obviously it's for demonstration purposes but i want to show you why this is interesting to keep consistent across the board if i define parser as the variable name i mean it's okay it wouldn't be idiomatic but the whole point of defining uh, variables across multiple methods is to keep them consistent so i have parser here p here and self down here now like i said uh, we should be trying to avoid avoid names like self this and me for example that are coming from another programming languages there is a um a linter called revive so if i use golang here Golang CI lint, which includes revive as part of the linters, what is going to happen is that it's going to be detecting not only the name that I used before, but also it should be also including and making or rather making it consistent across the different methods. So it's a way to detect and determine if one of our methods are not following the conventions that we define in the beginning which will not make our code idiomatic. So if we go back and modify this and let's say we can make it P all of them, the linter will not complain anymore and we will pass. Let's jump into, three, into tip number three. 
tip number three name your packages accordingly and to be honest with you this is a tough one it takes a while to get used to to get used to the feeling of the go language in the beginning when i started using the language five four yeah five six years ago i was naming my my packages using the convention that i that i, that I learned when i was using c sharp or uh, ruby uh, and i was using you know models handlers as the package names and typically that doesn't really make sense in the context of go so my recommendation and in order to follow and write idiomatic code will be to take you know as one step ahead and define hey what is this package supposed to be doing and what is this package supposed to represent is not what is inside of it but what is the uh, what is the thing that is implementing for example so i want to show you a better example of what i'm trying to say so give me a moment so for this tip i'm using the to do microservice that i've been describing for a while and the way i like to demonstrate this package naming convention is literally take one of each one of these package names and think about what it represents if i go and, and show you this and say hey this package name is called elastic search what would you think it, it, it includes obviously assuming you know what elastic search means right but let's think of a different one let's think postgresql which will be i think one of the most well-known databases in the world you should say hey maybe this refers to accessing postgresql databases right or accessing the postgresql database or maybe if i take redis it will say hey maybe this is this is about accessing redis so this naming depends on what the packages provide in the context of the thing that you're building is not what they do but rather what they provide okay so they provide access to this data store either kafka memcached redis rabbitmq and so on and so forth again this is one of the most difficult things in the beginning not not the actual programming language go is fantastic but li literally naming is tough in the beginning when you're trying to come up with package names so this is another thing to keep in mind and just you know don't, don't give up it takes a while to get used to this let's jump into tip number four group imports by their origin and what i mean by this is take each one of the imports that you're using all the packages that you're importing and then group those according to where are they coming from to give you a concrete example will be this so I have this example with the to-do microservice uh, again, and I'm taking uh, an ex uh, a implementation of the RabbitMQ data store. I mean, don't worry about that. That doesn't really matter. What matters here is that how I'm going to define each one of the packages that I'm using and how am I separating them, separating them uh, depending on where they're coming from. For example, I have here the standard library packages. Right here, I have my third party packages, which are the ones coming from you know external, external importations that are not necessarily, I'm not the maintainer, or maybe my team is not maintaining, uh, but I still I want to keep them together. Next and finally will be the packages that I, I, I know I'm maintaining, my team is maintaining and and everything the probably my organization is maintaining so i have a way to you know keep them all the way on the bottom so why are we doing this so this is a quick way to determine hey where are the packages coming from if i decide to add a new package i need to determine hey is this something that i need to maintain in the future is this something that probably i should be taking care of maybe i should be you know adding extra validations or maybe adding some security uh, certifications around it those kind of things so and also it determines hey where is this coming from in the context of the actual source or origin so let's jump into the final tip for writing idiomatic code in go last tip tip number five use short names for variables with limited scope but what does that mean let me show you for this example, I'm using the to-do microservice, specifically the implementation of the Elasticsearch package. What I want to show you specifically will be a method called search, which is right here, and one piece of code that it will resonate with you regarding this tip. Now, the implementation of this method really doesn't matter, but what, how this variable is used is what matters the most. So let me scroll down a little bit where the, the variable that I'm referring to is right here. 
So there is this variable called Q, and Q is supposed to be defining the arguments for doing a query in Elasticsearch. Don't worry how, about how that works in, in the first place. What matters here is that if I scroll down, let's see, 28, if I scroll down, I have Q highlighted, and hopefully you can see that Q begins from the definition of the variable which is a map of a string an interface an empty interface and is then used as a you know as the input of a json encoder which then eventually is going to be passed in in the actual http request for elasticsearch now what's happening here is actually really interesting because when you are using short names for variables you need to consider the scope of that variable if we were using for example a for loop typically what you would use it will be i and j to indicate the value and the index but if you're using a variable name that is one length the the length of the na the name the length of the name is shorter than probably two or three characters maybe that gets a little bit confusing to follow along within uh, you know the whole method and the recommendation here for writing idiomatic code will be instead of using q will be to give it a better name a longer name and if i run my linter uh, you will notice that it actually complains because say hey the variable q is too short for the scope or where of where it, it is being used if i go ahead and take uh, the variable and I rename it and I call it query and if I go ahead and run my linter it will not complete anymore and again it goes and uh, just please look at the screen and you will notice that query is being used more than what how many rows 26 rows so 26 lines so it, it it's it it takes a while to follow where is this variable coming from and that's why when you are defining variables try to give them long names is if those are outside of a uh, scope that you define in or to rephrase it if the variable name is just used in a few lines in the in the method or function just just don't worry about the name honestly just give it a short name and that's it you move on because that variable doesn't live long enough to give them some meaningful name and hopefully all of this makes sense these are five tips for writing idiomatic code in go i will continue sharing with you more tips in the next in a few in the future new, new episodes and if you know any of the you know if you know any any go idiomatic tips please let me know in the comments I, and if i use them of course i will give you credit and add it to the future videos okay so take care stay safe and i will talk to you next time bye bye